Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning and good afternoon to a virtual full house of 500 people watching across this great land of ours. Welcome to this 2020 presentation of the Royal Mock Gainsland Prize for Mental Health Research. My name is Lawrence Wall from CBC Radio One here in Ottawa. I'm delighted to be hosting today's ceremony. It's always great to be working with a class act like the Royal Ottawa Foundation. And today in particular, I'm grateful to them. You see, they've given me a reason to get dressed up for the first time in eight months. Thank you so much. This award is given annually to a Canadian clinical researcher in mental health. And this year's recipient, you may know already, is Dr. Nick Carlton. Nick is a professor of psychology at the University of Regina. He's the founding scientific director of the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment. We'll be meeting Nick very soon and I'll have a chance to chat with him after that about his work. Right after, we will add two people to our chat to hear their insight on this area of mental health. One is the head of a center in Ottawa that focuses on PTSD. The other is the coordinator of a peer support group for paramedics in Ottawa. We have a fairly tight timetable over the next 48 minutes or so, so let's get on with the show, shall we? I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Florence Druszynski. She is the president of the Royals Institute of Mental Health Research. Welcome, Dr. Druszynski. Thank you very much, Lawrence, and good afternoon to all. Um, what a privilege and a pleasure it is to talk about the Royal McGinsley Prize for Mental Health Research and to introduce our 2020 recipient, Dr. Nick Carlton. As you may know, the Royal McGinsley Prize for Mental Health Research was jointly established in 2015 by the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research and the McGinsley Foundation of Canada. This prestigious prize is funded by a generous donation from the McGinsley Foundation, building upon the wishes of its founders, Mr. Vaclav Mark and Dr. Hani Gensen to support mental health research. I would like to express my gratitude to the Magensen Foundation for their unwavering support to mental health research through this prize and other initiatives. The prize is awarded each year to a Canadian scholar who is an outstanding researcher under the age of 35 in the field of mental health to recognize, encourage, and support them as they pursue their research goals. Royal Magens Prize winners are selected by a globally renowned Blue Panel panel for their demonstrative track record in research, including excellence, scientific rigor, innovative thinking, imagination and originality, as well as a clear ability to work in partnership to achieve research translation and impact. Clearly, Dr. Nicholas Carlton exhibits all of this in abundance, and his research on mental health injuries among public safety personnel is far reaching, as you will hear about this in a few minutes. Dr. Carlton's innovative research takes place at the University of Regina and across the country. Thank you for your doing and congratulations. I would like to highlight the, highlight the presence of Dr. Thomas Chase today. He is the president and vice chancellor of the University of Regina. Congratulations to you as well. So thank you all for being here today to celebrate Dr. Carlton's research and trajectory in mental health research and please enjoy the event. I'm Nick Carlton, a professor of psychology at the University of Regina and scientific director of the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment. My research focuses on innovations in evidence-based mental health care for first responders and other public safety personnel. When hearing the term public safety personnel or PSP, most people think of the highly visible professions, firefighters, paramedics, and police. But there are many other types of PSP, such as our border services officers, indigenous emergency managers, search and rescue personnel, and numerous persons who support all PSP operations. All public safety personnel work hard to keep us safe, but in doing so, they can be exposed to a tremendous number of potentially psychologically traumatic events. As a child, my family were saved by public safety personnel after a terrible car accident. And after saving us, those same PSP went on to save others that night, and most nights for many years thereafter. As a result of their work, public safety personnel are at a higher risk for post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as other mental health injuries, like major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. 
Our research suggests that 44% of Canadian public safety personnel may meet criteria for one or more mental health injuries at any given time. That's as much as four times higher than most Canadians. The work that Nick is doing is changing the lives every day of our frontline members. You know, when I first started on SWAT, we used to have a call every, you know, probably 18 months, and now we're going out 40, 50 times a year. Uh, at the start, a lot of the researchers thought that, you know, a, a frontline member would maybe have a tr one traumatic experience throughout their uh, career, and they found out they probably have one traumatic experience per week. And it does take a toll on you, so this research is needed more now than ever. 20 years ago, people didn't even talk about this. People just struggled in their, uh, you know, at home uh, with their families and never really dealt about it. But now there's great programs there to help these members uh, that are dealing with these issues to continue to work, to get healthy, and uh, provide a great uh, service to their community. Mental health research like Dr. Carlton's is incredibly important to the University of Regina, and it's gaining importance all of the time. The University of Regina has been a leader in this area, and our Faculty of Arts in particular has become a real centre of excellence in mental health research. Our university motto is, as one who serves, and that text underscores the service and the greater good that is at the root of all we do. Dr. Carlton is a homegrown University of Regina researcher. He exemplifies the idea that our work should not stay within the walls of the university, but should serve others. Dr. Carlton's work in the area of post-traumatic stress injury does exactly that by supporting public safety personnel who themselves protect the vulnerable on a daily basis. He's one of our most distinguished alumni. He is compassionate, hardworking, and a joy to have at the University of Regina. The Canadian Institute for Public Safety, Research and Treatment is a national network based at the University of Regina and supported with funding from Public Safety Canada. Working in a consortium with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, our goal is to improve the lifetime wellness of public safety personnel, their leadership, and their families through collaborative research, knowledge exchange, and strategic partnerships. I was one of the founders of the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment, and I currently serve as scientific director. In short, we hope to ensure that public safety personnel have access to the best tools available to support their mental health. For example, PSPNet is a program that directly supports public safety personnel by providing tailored online therapy to help them manage post-traumatic stress injuries. The online content is supplemented by real therapists. PSPNet is freely available in Saskatchewan and Quebec right now, and we're already seeing very positive results. It's gratifying and humbling to be this year's Royal Mac Gainsland recipient. This is my life's work, and it's wonderful to be recognized for it. But more importantly, I'm inspired and affirmed that we're making positive differences in the mental health of public safety personnel. I look forward to continuing my efforts to support PSP, their leaders, and their families. Great, inspiring video. Thank you. Dr. Chris Carruthers is the former chief of staff at the Ottawa Hospital. He is now a healthcare consultant, and he's also the chair of the Mock Gainsland Foundation of Canada. Dr. Carruthers will present this year's award virtually to Dr. Nick Carlton. Dr. Carruthers, if you please. Thank you very much. For those who are not familiar uh, with the Mark Aislinn Foundation, it was established in 2001 to honor Mark Clough Mark and his wife, Dr. Hanny Gaislin. Mr. Mark was originally from Czechoslovakia, immigrated to Canada in 1953. He was a very successful in business and wanted to leave a legacy for medical research. The foundation has provided research grants totaling more than $6.8 million since its inception, specifically in cardiology, oncology, and psychiatry, particularly mental health research. This is the sixth year we are presenting the Royal Mark Gaislin Prize in conjunction with our partner, the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research. In a few short years, the prize has become a prestigious award for mental health researchers in Canada. It targets mid-career researchers at a point in their work where the award can make a big difference in what they can accomplish. And is highlighted with past winners, varied, varied fields of research, drug treatment for bipolar disorder, early intervention in children with mental health issues, 
bipolar disorder and cardiovascular vascular health issues in teens, the long-term consequences of child maltreatment, and discoveries about the risk factors for addictions. And now, mental health and first responders and other public safety personnel. Awareness of stress injuries in these critical workers has increased in recent years. We have research like today's award winner to thank for the growing awareness. Our society needs to better support the people who keep us safe, both because we rely on them and because we ask them to face difficult situations every day on, on our behalf. Dr. Nicholas Carlton is an excellent choice for the 2020 Royal Mark Gazin Award. His work brings research to bear on protecting the mental health of public safety personnel and is going from the academy to the front lines to give these professionals tools to face the challenge of their work. As you know, we have to find <clears throat> new ways to do things in 2020. So at this point, I would normally pass the trophy to Dr. Carl. Since I'm in Ottawa and he is in Regina, we have asked the interim president of the University of Regina, Dr. Thomas Chase, to make the presentation on behalf of the Royals Institute of Mental Health Research and the Mark Gaislin Foundation. Hello and good day to all watching this call. I'm bringing you greetings from Treaty 4 territory, the homeland of the Cree, the Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Lakota peoples, and of course, the Métis. Dr. Carruthers, if I might, I'd like to repeat words that you spoke when the announcement of the award was made. You said Dr. Carlton's work to treat and prevent post-traumatic stress injuries among public safety personnel is the epitome of Canadian research in mental health foundation wished to recognize. I could not agree more. Nick Carlton is so many things. He is a compassionate person devoted to helping others. He is a brilliant researcher. He is an inspiring teacher. He has a work ethic that is astonishing. And for someone who is still pretty early in his career, he has a tremendous record of accomplishment. He is certainly by any count, one of our most distinguished alumni and someone whose work epitomizes our motto as a university as one who serves. Dr. Carlton, you represent the best of our university and you represent the best of mental health research and treatment in our great country. So on behalf of the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research, the Mach Gainsland Foundation of Canada and the University of Regina, it is an honor to present you with the 2020 Royal Mach Gainsland Prize. Congratulations and thank you for the work you do for public safety personnel Thank you very much, Dr. Chase. I'm deeply honored to receive the award and be this year's recipient of what has become the prestige and premier award of mental health uh, in Canada. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversations this morning and hopefully we will uh, enjoy a, a variety of different discussions with everyone involved. Congratulations, Nick. That's a, a great award and, and a great honor. Thank you, Dr. Chase, for that. This is the part of the program that I've really been looking forward to because this is the point where I get to chat with Nick about his work. And there's a lot to talk about. For example, as mentioned, he is the founding scientific director of the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment, or SIPCERT for short, love the acronym. This group supports the mental health of more than 300,000 public safety personnel in this country. It's also helping to develop the Internet Cognitive Behavior Therapy Program for public safety personnel. And SIPCERT is also working with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to support dozens of mental health projects for public safety personnel. And he's studying PTSD among members of the RCMP to develop new standards and tools that will assess and prevent mental health injuries on the force. So it's work that would be relevant and timely any day of the week, year, month, but now 
with uh, right in the middle of a pandemic couldn't be more relevant. So I see Nick appearing on camera. Congratulations again. It's a well-deserved honor from everything that you do. When I hear the term public safety personnel, and I think most people, we think police, fire, ambulance. But as you've alluded to, there is much more than that. The numbers are far greater. Tell us about that. Well, there are about 325,000 public safety personnel working in Canada right now. And uh, there's a great many that are quite highly visible, like our firefighters, our paramedics, and our police officers. But there's also invisible labor. So uh, that would include our correctional officers and our correctional workers and our communications officials and our, so our 911 and dispatch. These are people who are often out of sight, and so they end up out of mind. But our correctional officers and workers regularly work to keep the, our, us safe and the people that they care for safe. And when we call 911, we often forget that the first person who answers is the first responder. So that makes uh, all of them critical components of our public safety personnel team. So the PSP title includes 911 operators, for example. Absolutely, it does. Absolutely. Which is something that we never think about. I'm glad you pointed that out. It, on the video, you mentioned this terrible car crash that your family was involved in when you were a kid. Can you can you tell us more about that? What happened and, and the role of the PSPs in helping your family? Sure. So I was quite young. Uh, I would have been about six years of age at the time. Uh, we were living in Edmonton. And unfortunately, a drunk teenage driver had stolen a vehicle and lost control of the vehicle and hit uh, our car quite badly. Uh, it, was a, it was certainly a very dramatic accident. And as part of that dramatic accident, by chance, there was an off-duty uh, police officer, someone who had just come, off, come off the shift, who was walking home, who happened to see the entire accident. And he was the first one on the scene, followed shortly thereafter, of course, by our paramedics and our firefighters. But that police officer who had just finished a shift stayed with us for several hours thereafter. And of course, the, the paramedics and the firefighters that used the jaws of life to extract us from the car, all of those people went and, and did Herculean efforts to save my family's life. And what I think is, is particularly important is that that police officer probably went back to his next shift afterwards, just like all of the paramedics and firefighters went back to their next shifts afterwards as well. So I think it's important for us to recognize that while that was a major event for my family, just like many of us might have one or two of those major events in our lives, for our public safety personnel, that's part of their daily existence is looking after all of us, despite the exposures that they have to experience to uh, a numerous potentially psychologically traumatic events. And as a six-year-old boy, did you say, I'm going to grow up and study these kinds of workers, or was it more organic in the back of your mind? Your interest was piqued. You wanted to do some kind of work that would help them. Is that, was that the, the general focus after that crash? I, I think so. I think it was more organic than anything else. And it was as I, I developed and went into university, uh, my honors class was, uh, my honors thesis this pardon me, was done with Dr. Gordon Asmundson, and that was focused very much on 9-11 because I was doing it uh, just as 9-11 occurred. And one of the things that really struck me then, and I think was, uh, was a reminder of what had happened in my youth, was so many people were rushing out as they should have been, but at the same time, you watched so many public safety personnel rushing right in to danger. And at that point, I think that was, uh, that was probably the galvanizing moment for me when I realized these people are doing such a tremendous amount of work for us who's making sure that we're providing them with all of the supports that we possibly can to protect their mental health as well. I would assume if asked that the main mental health issue facing PSPs would be that of PTSD. Is that the case or is it something else? Is PTSD simply one part of it? Well, we do tend to think of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, at first and foremost when we think about this challenge, these challenges. And it makes sense because of what public safety personnel do for all of us. They manage trauma, among other things, but certainly trauma is a highlight. But it's only one of many possible mental health injuries, including major depressive disorder, which actually appears to be slightly more common for our public safety personnel than PTSD. So while there's a, a variety of different foci, I think PTSD, major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, all of these warrant attention because all of them could be a mental health injury experienced by our public safety personnel. You mentioned earlier when we were talking that 
one of the key factors in the life of a PSP is uncertainty. And that I found that so fascinating because we all face uncertainty. That's part of life, but it's a different frame with a PSP person. How does that work? Tell us about that. Well, uncertainty in general is something that we don't care for as a, as a species. We prefer to know rather than not know, and that's permeated a lot of our popular literature. You, you hear it quite often in phrases. I, I don't care. It would just be better if I knew, then I could move on. So we really don't like uncertainty. But for most of us, that uncertainty isn't necessarily tied with a consistent sense of threat. In contrast, for our public safety personnel, they experience ongoing uncertainty that can be coupled with threat on a regular basis. We don't often tie those things together because of how most of us experience our interactions with the public safety personnel. But if you think of a police officer, for example, who has pulled someone over and they may have pulled them over for speeding or they may have pulled them over for another traffic violation, but that walk for the police officer from the car that they are standing at over to that front window, that's a very long walk because they have no idea what's on the other side of that window, no idea what's waiting for them and what may or may not happen. For most of us, we may take it for granted that we think it's not a potential threat, but for them it is. And then we see similar challenges, for example, for our paramedics who uh, right now, particularly with COVID-19, they are going out to try and save all of us still, but they're not necessarily sure whether they need to take extra PPE with them. They're not sure whether or not somebody is at risk. And that's before we, uh, we discuss countless other challenges challenges where various PSP engage with potentially life-threatening events as part of doing their daily job without really knowing whether they're safe. Part of your work, let me just make sure that, yes, my mic is on. Part of your work focuses on developing tools to help reduce the prevalence and impact of mental health issues among PSPs. How do these tools work and, and how can they be applied well, we've got a variety of different tools. Probably the first tool that we came out with was the free anonymous online screening tool that allows public safety personnel to assess their own symptoms and compare them to the general population or to other public safety personnel. But probably the largest project that we've done so far that's having that kind of direct frontline impact is the PSPNet project. And that's being led by the internationally renowned researcher, Dr. Heather Hedrestrovopoulos. And I'm honored to be her co-lead on that project. The project is designed to develop, deploy and evaluate an internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy that has been specifically tailored with our public safety personnel to their needs. And this isn't self-help. This is real patients working with real therapists and getting real results to improve their mental health. There is a pilot project that is operating in both Quebec and Saskatchewan, and it deals specifically with public safety personnel. Can you tell us what that involves and how soon, if it's successful, this might be applied to the entire country? Sure, that pilot project is, a, is the PSPNet project and is available in both provinces right now for any public safety personnel who uh, are interested. They can log on to a website and complete a brief, screening, a brief screening form and sign up so that they can then begin working on a trans-diagnostic course of treatment or a PTSD-specific course of treatment in order to improve their own mental health. They engage in an assessment with a real therapist and then they have ongoing therapeutic support. Essentially over eight weeks, they go through what we would see as cognitive behavioral therapy treatment, but it's treatment that involves a specific focus on our public safety personnel so that they can engage with therapists who understand their needs and they can engage with examples and solutions that are specifically tailored to what they engage with on a regular basis. So just because it works necessarily for us doesn't mean it accommodates all of the special challenges faced by our public safety personnel. Are there early indications of how well it's working and uh, how, how soon it might be applied for the entire country? There are indeed. Uh, so the, the early indications are incredibly positive. Uh, 85 or more percent are completing within the eight week period of the course of treatment. 95 plus percent say that they would either refer a friend or a family member or that the treatment was worth their time. And the vast majority are reporting clinically significant improvements, such as from before treatment to after treatment, they're no longer meeting clinical criteria for the challenges that they came to us with. 
And as for getting it across the entire country, we're actively working right now, uh, very gratefully with Public Safety Canada and a variety of other supporting stakeholders to try and expand to other provinces and make it available as soon as is humanly possible. It's the number one request we get from our public safety personnel outside of Quebec and Saskatchewan is how soon can we have access to PSPNet. Great. I want to talk about the pandemic. It's had a terrible effect on all of us. I can only imagine how that has affected PSPs. It must be to the 10th power. How, just how significant, how, how much of a factor has it been in the daily lives of your typical PSP? Well, our public safety personnel didn't have a lot of additional capacity uh, when we began the pandemic back in February. They weren't saying things like we've got you know, people that are standing around looking for something to do. A lot of them were already reporting that uh, there wasn't enough back support. There wasn't enough public safety personnel humans for all of the things they wanted to do. And our public safety personnel regularly face uh, ongoing challenges and stressors without having COVID-19. But in the case of COVID-19, now we've layered multiple additional challenges on top of that. They still need to engage and safely protect all of us, but they need to keep themselves safe as well. This means extra PPE on top of everything else that they're doing. This also means that they may not be sure whether they're taking the COVID-19 virus back home to their friends and their family members. They may not know whether they are infected this time or not because they may not know if we're infected. So on top of all of the regular job stressors that they have, now they're coping with COVID-19. And they're also coping with us coping with COVID-19. Because when things go wrong for us, they're still our first line of defense. So when we're not following the rules, when we're not engaging with good practices and good safety behaviors, ultimately they're the ones that have to step in and protect the rest of the population. So for them, I think we've seen orders of magnitude of increased stress especially since in this case, for example, there have been uh, police agencies that have had to pull entire hundreds of, of officers off the line in order to quarantine them. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't happen without a consequence. The ones who are off the line feel upset and guilty because they're not able to protect and serve with the rest of their colleagues. And the ones that are on the front line continue to provide the same level of service to the best of their abilities for all of us. So I have a great, uh, I have a great amount of, of gratitude for the incredible job that they're doing under extraordinary circumstances. So say we all. Thank you very much. I want to expand our chat now by bringing in two more voices to our conversation, people with a lot of relevance and insight into the areas that we're talking about. Uh, the first is Dr. Patrick Smith. He is the CEO for the Center of Excellence on post-traumatic stress disorder and related mental health conditions. He's based at the Royal, as is the center. Dr. Smith has more than 25 years experience leading clinical and research programs in the field of mental health and addictions. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Lorraine Downey is a paramedic and the coordinator of the Ottawa Paramedic Peer Support Team. This is a 50 member volunteer team. It gives first responders 24 seven access to one-on-one -on -one support and crisis intervention resources. This team was recognized last year at the Royals Inspiration Awards Gala, a richly deserved award. Welcome to you both. Now, and audience, I should say, we're gonna be talking now for about uh, 20 minutes or so. I'm gonna try to save time at the end for one or two questions from our beloved audience out in Etherland. If you do have a question, you can click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and uh, type in your question and I'll do my best to get to one or two of those. Welcome panelists. I want to start with you, Lorraine. I, I, you've got a front row seat on this issue if any one of us does. What are the challenges of stress and uncertainty in public safety work and how do they affect mental well-being for paramedics? Well, our challenges are not just the traumatic and the critical events, but it's the everyday. It's the cumulative effects of our benign and our tragic calls. It's the life and workplace uncertainties that are now worse with COVID, with the PPE, et cetera. But it's also life challenges. It's relationship breakdowns. It's our personal health. And when all of these strike at the same time, our ability to remain resilient has been very taxed. We're very adaptable, but it's been tough. 2020 has really been the perfect storm. We have increased uncertainty, as, as uh, Dr. Carlton referred to, increased change. We're dealing with a very prolonged event, and we're dealing with life challenges as healthcare workers and public safety personnel. We have kids. We're juggling homeschooling. We're juggling isolation. We have those that are caregivers. And someone referred to me the other day as, it feels like Groundhog Day. 
you know, do I have COVID? I have signs and symptoms. I have to go get swabbed, isolate. And there's a, a real lack of support and it's no one's fault. It's just everyone that we normally uh, refer to to support us is going through the same thing. We don't have our families nearby, they're distant. We don't have our social time, our gym time. So our mental wellness has really been suffering and we feel done, but unfortunately COVID is not done. So that's kind of how I would summarize it. Thank you. Patrick, your center, Center of Excellence on PTSD has developed what I think is a fascinating document. I was reading it last night, a guide to moral injury for healthcare workers during COVID-19. That was a new term for me. What is moral injury and why should we think, be thinking about this term, especially now during the pandemic? Well, the term moral injury really comes from the field of military and veterans research. And it's understanding that when we think about PTSD, most people think about combat stress. Someone who has hypervigilance may take cover if they hear a sound that sounds like a mortar going off. Um, but the moral injury is actually something a little bit more nuanced. It's someone who we often hear veterans talk about um, when the experiences that their own personal moral values and their conscience bumps up against the rules of engagement. And, and when, when um, we worked with Phoenix, Australia to take the construct and look at it in the, in the time of COVID for healthcare workers. And really what we found is, um, you know, it makes total sense for a nurse that the family members can't come uh, to, to a COVID ward to say, to visit um, family because of the risk of um, exposure. But the ninth and 10th time that that nurse is holding a phone up to a family, to be the conduit to a family member, to a dying COVID patient, it's, it starts to really wear on the individual. And as Lorraine said, you know, the very people that are there taking care of us, we have to have someone taking care of them. And, and they're going through the same pandemic, the same exposure, worried about bringing COVID home to their kids or their elderly parents. Um, and so the real focus is what can we do to make sure not to wait till the end of the, ex of the pandemic to see how many people um, have stressors and, and need services, what can we do as organizations to support those uh, individuals at a team and organization level now? Is there an indication that, that, there, that you're seeing a great increase in the number of people with these kinds of moral injuries? Absolutely. And it's not just moral injuries. As, as Nick mentioned earlier, it's moral injury, PTSD, all kinds of mental health challenges because like Lorraine said, everyone's going through this pandemic at the same time. We're calling them heroes, but they're still going in with some of the same concerns that every Canadian has. Um, and what many countries have said is you can model, if you did nothing, you could model um, and look at the number of individual healthcare workers and other first responders who at the end of the day are going to need to seek service. And then you could build that surge response. What we're saying is that's the curve we wanna flatten. If we put in the right kinds of services and supports, we can't necessarily prevent um, individual exposure to these events. But when you realize that your organization is doing everything they can, they understand what you're going through and they're doing everything they can to support you through this, that's gonna mitigate the number of people who come out at the, uh, the other end of this needing those kinds of clinical services. Thank you. Lorraine, I'm fascinated by the Ottawa Paramedic Peer Support Group. I'd love to know how it works. And I'd love to know if you've seen a change in the need for this kind of support in the last eight months during the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, so our peer support program is based uh, on more of a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach. Six years ago, we really changed uh, our, our focus and not just waiting for bad calls or critical events to happen to basically offer support to our peers. But in 2014, we said, you know what? People are going through stressors on a daily basis, workplace stressors, life stressors, and we need to be there for them. So that really changed our focus. So our goal is to listen, but it's more importantly to consistently be there for people. We're there to action help. We're hopefully modeling healthy behaviors, rid of you know, things like self-awareness, 
self-care, empathy, and we really have worked to build relationships before they need peer support. We have also really focused on reaching in. So don't expect someone who's in crisis or having a bad day to always reach out. They don't have the capacity, but if they know there's a helping hand nearby or you know, if someone cares, they will accept that help. So we're very fortunate in Ottawa that we actually have a lot of support for our program. It's been awesome. We have a dedicated room at our headquarters. It's a very welcome room. That's where I am right now. So we have, you know, coffee, treats, Kleenex, and we also have a door that closes. So there's privacy. We have worked to normalize it. So it's okay to be seen chatting with a peer support member. It's okay to be seen in the peer support room. And that is one of the things that I think has really um, increased our usage of peer support since COVID. In 2020, our usage of peer support has been up 50% over 2019, and we have a couple weeks to go. So we're very thankful that our peers have the courage to reach out and that our peer support team members can still reach in to help their peers. We're a stepping stone to help. And sometimes peer support is the first stepping stone that people take to get mental health help. So thank you. Well, I'm just reflecting on that figure of 50% increase. And it, it really begs the question, if your group weren't there, what then? I mean, how, how would people who need this kind of support, would they take that next step to reach out to other organizations which are out there, but you're a kind of bridge. Would, do you think yeah. that they would have reached out without your group being there? they may they may not have sometimes they just need gentle encouragement and they also need to talk to a peer that's been there like you know i've reached out for help before it helped me maybe this is the time that you should so that gentle encouragement sometimes all people need thank you nick i want to ask you about the role of governments and what they can do in in this area to try to prevent mental health injuries for psps and and let's add public safety leaders as well what what can those two groups do in order to minimize the risk and to try to get help as soon as possible for PSPs when there are mental health concerns? Those are terrific questions. Uh, I think our governments have an opportunity to play a tremendous leadership role on multiple fronts. They can model good leadership and good behaviors with respect to mental health. They can model uh, accessible self-care. They can model access to evidence-based treatments. They can also facilitate making sure that evidence-based treatment protocols are accessible and available to all the Canadians who need it. So we can do that through policies. We can do that through funding initiatives. I think they have a tremendous opportunity to make a big difference for everyone on all of those fronts. And uh, in my experience, uh, I've had the great pleasure of working with Public Safety Canada on this uh, over the last several years, and they have done exactly that. They've been tremendous and proactive with respect to trying to manage the mental health going forward of our public safety personnel. Nick, I don't want to end a promising career today, but let me ask you this question, and that is, do you think that governments are on side? Do you think that governments, and I, I talk about pr provincial and federal governments, municipal as well, are they on side with this issue? Do they treat it seriously enough? Or is there still more that they could do in order to address the concerns? Every government leader that I've talked to has been an active proponent and supporter of trying to protect mental health, especially for our public safety personnel and our frontline workers and our military and our veterans, but for the communities in general. And we've seen that as part of the, the National Action Plan on PTSD, as part of the pending National Action Plan and strategy on suicide. So I do believe our government leaders are hearing the research evidence and they are doing their best to follow evidence-based practices and support those for our entire community. Uh, I, I think my experience with them has been that they very much turn to the leaders across the country in, in research and in treatment, and they have been following their advice to the best of their capacity. But research is a little bit slow. So you could ask me, what's the best thing that we can do, Nick? We'll, we'll give you all the money in the world just to do the one thing that's going to fix this forever. And we don't have those answers yet. So it's a slow process, but it's one that we're excited to make continuous progress on. But it's exciting because it's, it's as though you're in the middle of this journey and you don't know how the journey will end necessarily. Absolutely. I certainly hope that it ends uh, that it ends well for absolutely everyone. In my ideal world, we would all have uh, unlimited access to all of the mental health care that we need 
as part of a series of stepped care models, starting with potentially peer support, which I think is absolutely critical foundation for so many of our community members and our professionals, leading through to ICBT options, to in-person options, to inpatient options, so that we can provide the right care for the right people at the right time, so that we can best maximize their chances for a fulsome life, irrespective of the challenges they're having with mental health. Patrick, we've been talking about what programs are available. People like Nick have been working on to help PSPs. What can a typical, if there is such a thing, public safety personnel do to try to guard themselves against this kind of moral injury that you were talking about and mental health issues in general? Is there something that they can do on their own to protect themselves? Absolutely. There, there are individual um, wellness um, tips um, and all the things that are important for self-care. And, you know, in our moral injury guide, you'll see that we have recommendations at the organization level, the team level, and the individual level. Um, and, you know, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of work in Canada. Canada is the first and only country that has a psychological health and safety um, standard for the workplace. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about that, the Bell Let's Talk, and really raising awareness for mental health. Um, I think where we're really interested is leaning into the organizational opportunities so that while there are things that individuals can do, the fact that Lorraine has the organizational support to have the programs that they have, what we know is the biggest bang for buck is gonna be taking a mental health in the workplace perspective and really um, supporting grocery store workers um, through working with their leaders, helping hospital CEOs understand how to implement the recommendations so that their people can feel supported. So um, when we've been doing this work with moral injury, almost everyone we talk to um, on the front lines can talk about the difference between an organization that fully understands the challenges that they're going through that may not be able to provide all the prevention from some of these potentially traumatic um, experiences, but they feel like they have their backs. And, and then the range from that all the way through to my organization doesn't know what I'm, what we're going through. We don't feel like we have the support that we need. Um, and so I often talk about, um, it's as important to have the psychological PPE um, to get through this, just like we just like we think about the physical PPE, and it's really um, what we've experienced as leaders who have engaged in this. The Royal um, uh, Hospital is one of the organizations that raised their hand, saying we want to really be Uber adopters of this of these recommendations. You start to see that they feel empowered because they want, as Nick said, government leaders, employers, they want to do the right thing. And having those tools, it actually empowers them uh, to, to reach out and to, it's messaging, it's honest, transparent communication. There's so many things the organizations can do to make it possible for those individuals to, to do the self-care and support each other as peers. Thank you. I want to bring in a critical element here that we haven't really been talking about yet. I suspect all three of you could answer it quite well, but so I'm just going to make it an open question for anyone who wants to pick it up, and that is the families of public safety personnel. What sort of an impact do they face when a PSP has a mental health issue? And what can be done to help these families, the loved ones who are directly affected by this? I threw this open. Lorraine, if you want to answer it or anyone else. Um, so I fortunately or unfortunately know a great deal of people who um, um, have dealt with mental health, uh, coworkers, peers, friends, and the impact on the family is enormous. Uh, a lot of these people are unwell for a very long time before they get the proper help, the assessment, the treatment. And so the families really struggle for a long time before diagnosis, but then they also struggle for a long time after diagnosis and during treatment and then possibly reintegration back into the workplace. And it's not always, um, there's not always the support for the families because uh, just because someone works uh, as a paramedic, a, a police officer, a firefighter, corrections, they may not have a connection. The family member may not have a connection back to the organization and they may not really feel very um, disconnected 
from whatever resources might actually be available to them. They don't even know what the resources are as a family member. So that's been one of the challenges. And then um, being a family member of a public safety personnel, you have to be a special person. Uh, we're not probably the easiest people to live with sometimes. We have unique experiences. We have our unique lingo, things like that. We have a unique culture. We think we have a unique culture. And when you add mental health challenges on top of it, it's hard for family members. So, you know, thank you for bearing with us. We appreciate you. Thank you. I want I to would, take a, sorry, would, go ahead, Patrick. Uh, add that, um, you know, at our center, we're really focused on um, veterans. And we know that if a soldier has served their country, um, then so is the family. And so our, we say we look through this eye through the family or the, the veteran and this side through the family. And what we are really focused on is the power of peer support for the family. So just when we look across Canada and the great uh, veterans organizations, Peers Helping Peers, um, there are as many family members helping family members. And so mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more that it's an area of focus that we need to, um, we need to pay attention to and raise awareness of the role that they're playing and, and the resilience and the strength that they're showing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a question from the audience and I just want to read that it's directed toward Nick. So it reads as follows, it's from Melissa. Could you comment further on this constant exposure to the unknown that PSPs go through and the impact that this exposure to risk must also have on their family and loved ones just by their proximity of being with the PSP? Well, this is your chance to ask, answer the question uh, about families and loved ones. Families are definitely the front line for mental health. And I think we may have known that intuitively, but we certainly now have more and more research evidence that, that underscores that truth. The public safety personnel are regularly exposed to uncertainty, but so are their families. And so when, a, when any PSP leaves the house that morning or that evening or that afternoon, the family doesn't know necessarily that they're coming home safely. When they hear that there's an accident, when they hear that there's an event taking place in their home city, they're not sure. And so, the challenges that we all face as human beings in managing uncertainty and how that can increase our risk for mental health, they get exacerbated for our public safety personnel, and that burden is definitely shared by their families who often sit helpless with uncertainty as they watch events unfold, hoping their loved ones are okay. So I think it, it certainly has a magnifying effect on them, and it certainly, I would imagine, is a huge challenge for, for their mental health as well. Thank you. I want to close up. We've got about uh, one minute left. So I want a really short answer from all three of you, if you would please. What is the one thing that you would like people watching this webinar, this event, to take away, whether they're public safety personnel or not? What's the one thing that they can take away from this based on what they've been watching for the last 48 minutes or so? Let's start with Lorraine. I think the one thing I'd like to reiterate is everyone is peer support. You can uh, reach out to anyone in any capacity as a friend, a neighbor, a loved one. Um, so please take the time, especially with this holiday season coming up, to reach out to other people. We call it reaching in, but please reach out. It's the one thing that might really make a difference to people this, this holiday season and, and during COVID. Thank you. Patrick. I would say, again, it's to the leaders, organizations, if you own a grocery store, if you run a hospital, um, if you're someone who um, uh, leads a team, make space for the meaning making of what's going on, the ambiguity, the uncertainty, um, and try, try to just have that o those open communication. The recommendations um, that are simple and they will have a huge impact on a vast number of individuals um, that, you, that you lead. Nick. Just keeping going. Uh, just keeping going is a success, especially now. We need to set reasonable and flexible expectations for ourselves and others, meeting success with celebration and failure with compassion for all of us. Thank you. That's a wonderful conclusion to a fascinating panel. I really enjoyed that. Uh, thank you, panelists. You've really given us insight into this topic that I don't think anyone else could have done in quite the same way. We appreciate your taking the time to tell us about the important work that you're all doing, and, and long may you continue with us. We're coming to the end of this event. It's 1249 Eastern, 1149 in Regina. Thanks to our national audience for tuning in. We appreciate your interest. I want to give a quick shout out to Steve in the audiovisual department of the University of Regina for doing such a great job today. Steve, we had both audio and video for this event. You, sir, deserve a raise. 
To wrap up this event, I'd like to call on the CEO of the Royal Foundation, Mitchell Bellman, and once again, the president of the Royal's Institute of Mental Health Research, Dr. Florence Durzinski, to make some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for a wonderful conversation and presentation. Thank you for being here with us. One last time, I would like to congratulate Dr. Carlton and thank certainly Patrick and Lauren and Chris for this wonderful conversation. A shout out to our communication team for a successful event. Uh, I think Royal Magnus and Prize event are always a special celebration of mental health research. I'll just share one last thought is, is that the Royal Magenson event is always a highlight of the importance of ongoing learning and ongoing conversation about mental health in pandemic times and in all times. So please take good care. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Mitchell Bellman, who is the president and CEO of the Royal Ottawa Foundation for Mental Health Research. Thank you very much, Florence. Uh, and thank you everyone for participating today. This is the largest gathering that we have ever had to watch the Royals Mach Gainsland uh, Award presentation. Uh, it's one of the ironies of COVID is that more of us can gather uh, and benefit from such a, a fascinating lecture and to watch a, a great researcher be recognized. I want to thank the Mach Gainsland Board uh, who are here today for their visionary leadership in creating this award and in continuing to support uh, celebrating uh, great mental health research. I also want to extend uh, my thanks to Lawrence Wall for being an outstanding host and always a wonderful supporter of the cause of mental health. Uh, I thank the pa our panelists, uh, Dr. Patrick Smith and Lorraine Downey, and once again, congratulations to Dr. Nicholas Carlton. Uh, we look forward to hearing much more about your research in the years to come, and we hope one day soon we'll be able to congratulate you in person uh, for all of us here in Ottawa. Uh, we look forward to the day that we can do that. Thank you all for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of the day.